like to welcome you to Boy Meets Wellness, a podcast that discusses the complexities, celebrations, and challenges of building a wellness ritual as a BOI, a person who is born obviously incredible. You are now listening to Boy Meets Wellness with poet, motivational speaker, and wellness lover, Evolve Benton. BOI, born obviously incredible, especially when you wear it pretty. Happy Friday, Boy Meets Wellness community. If you're feeling the episodes, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Also, sharing is caring, so feel free to share the podcast with friends, family, and loved ones. Today's episode features my good friend, Patricio Manuel, also known as Pat. Patricio Manuel is the first professional male boxer who is transgender. He debuted with Golden Boy Promotions on December 8, 2018, and won a four-round decision in the super featherweight division. Prior to transitioning, Pat was a five-time national champion in the amateur women's division, participating in the first-ever U.S. Women's Olympic Boxing Trails in 2012. Losing his Olympic dream gave Pat the freedom to finally share with the world what he had already known in his heart. He was a man. In 2013, He began medically transitioning and stepped back into the ring on May 5th, 2016 in the amateur male division and won. His story has garnered major press, including the front page of the LA Times, covers through HBO, Time, People, USA Today, Newsweek, NPR, NBC, BBC, Sports Illustrated, and ESPN. In 2019, he made another historic first by becoming the first face of Everlast Boxing Equipment. And he's just also an amazing, dope friend. So thank you so much for coming to our community, Pat. This week's wellness tip is all about getting started. So I've started a lot of things, (laughs) but getting started now is what's really important. So I haven't really talked about my personal goals on the podcast, but I thought I should share some of them with you all. I mean, we are building a community here. One of my main goals is to build an online business that I can manage from anywhere in the world. So I've been building my skill set up by following brand strategists and others that have built online businesses. In my search for experts, I found a person called the Six Figure Chick. I started to engage with some of her content earlier this year, and then COVID-19 came, and I had to pivot my business like many of us. So I stopped really you know, tuning into her content. Recently, I found out that the six-figure chick, aka Cece, passed away recently from cancer. And she shared her narrative of health throughout her journey as an entrepreneur. So it wasn't surprising, but it definitely still saddened me. I didn't get to meet her. I didn't really get to engage with her. She actually started her business because she knew she would never be able to work again in the same way due to her cancer. So the last five years of her life, she built this million-dollar online business. And while that is super impressive, what's even more beautiful to me is all the knowledge she left the entrepreneur community. So I recently purchased some of her eBooks and courses, and it's already started to shift my mind, goals, and business. So I tell you this story to amplify the importance of starting now and not waiting on your goals. Cece left us a legacy. She left us her work, her passion, and her blueprint. And she did all that because she started then and now. The six-figure chick literally started her online business in her phone during a chemotherapy appointment. So we must start now and deliver our gifts to the world because we don't know how much time we have in human form. This isn't to bring shame or fear up for you. This is to push you to go, to start now, to dig deeper, and to live an incredible life. Today's episode is brought to you by Mar Media Productions. Mar Media is a media production company that produces, publishes, and uplifts the stories, art, and journeys of queer and trans people of color and the people who make our lives incredible. Now for our interview with my dope, fly friend, who's way more than an athlete, Pat Manuel. Hello, world. Welcome to Boy Meets Wellness. I'm excited about today's interview with my friend, dear friend, Pat Manuel. Hi, Pat. How are you doing today? Can you just let the folks know full name, pronouns, and for our first question, what brings you joy? 
All right. Uh, first off, doing pretty well. Really excited to be talking to you here. You know, we've known each other for for a minute. Um, so I'm grateful that you brought me into a project and that we get to have this kind of relationship uh, with each other. You know, my full name is Patricio Manuel. A lot of people call me Pat. Um, I'm also known as Kakawate or Peanut in the boxing world uh, because my head's so small. Um, what's, what's bringing me joy? Was that the question? Yep. Bringing me joy right now is I'm sitting out in the sun uh, in a beautiful house up in the mountains of the San Gabriel Valley. And I have my newer pit bull with me and just really enjoying, you know, nature and animals and like the connection I get to have to them by living in this place. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So I've always had like big dogs. Is this something, something about you that is attracted to big dogs? Are they attracted to you? Because I know in my world, when I'm walking up and down the street, I'm always like being greeted, greeted by the larger animals. So when did you first start this relationship with like supporting and having such beautiful dogs? I think it started with probably started with my family. We've always had dogs. I grew up in a house of like multiple dogs and multiple cats. And my family was always like a big dog having type of people. So I think it's all, you know, honestly, all dogs tend to like me really well. People will be like, that dog never likes anyone, but it seems to like you. Um, Because I think I understand them a bit more than I do people sometimes. But I'm also not afraid of big dogs. And I think a lot of people have fear and hesitation. Um, around larger dog breeds and the dogs sense and are like, okay, if you're feeling skittish, then I feel skittish and I'm going to stay away from you Mm. where I'm willing to be like, Hey, I see you dog. Like I'm also like, I know how to speak your language a little bit more. So most of them really connect with me very well. And, you know, I just, I love dogs. They're so loyal. They love us. Um, You know, I also think what we've done to them has been pretty cruel like the way they have been forced to be codependent with humans but we treat them so poorly like most of the dogs that I've owned in my life have been rescues and this current dog named Meatball he's a very muscular black pit bull with cropped ears and he was in and out of shelters and rescues for almost four years of his life so I was really it was like the, the good thing about COVID is that It allowed me to be like, I have the time to adopt and work with an animal that has had um, this kind of just trauma in his life. And I, you know, I love him so much. And he's such willing, he's so willing to love and make himself a part of a family after only three months, even though he's been given back, even though he's been, you know, incarcerated, um, essentially. So really grateful for the love this guy is willing to give me. And I feel it's my responsibility to make sure that he's safe and taken care of and also give him that love back. Oh, you're such a good dog parent. Thank you for being that. <laughs> bad. So we're going to have to add AKA dog whisper to your endless <laughs> names, right? <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of like COVID-19, how have you been? Like what has been like your wellness practice during this time? Uh, I mean, it's been really rocky and I, I know that that has been everyone's experience. I don't, think anyone hasn't been negatively impacted by this, even the people who have found opportunities during this pandemic. And that's like, yes, shade to the Jeff Bezos out there, but also this acknowledgement for other people that, you know, this time to slow down and be home has actually been um, useful to people who have, you know, especially like my partner, Amita Swadin, who's a consultant who's often flying. Like I've been really grateful. They've been home for the longest time. They've been I think dating me, you know, so I've been really grateful for that, even though it's come at such an expense. You know, for me, it's been really difficult because, you know, I'm a boxer to have the gyms closed down, to have basically the sport shut down in a way that never has before, um, especially as I know I'm at the end of my career and I'm in a, a limited timeline has been really difficult. And I'm a really routine person. So to suddenly have my whole routine of like going to the gym and training and boxing being my primary focus thrown out, you know, has been really hard. But I'm always someone that looks for those opportunities in, you know, these type of situations. And I've really worked on um, repairing some of the injuries that I've had for a long time, the chronic injuries, I was forced out of fights last year, uh, due to a bad hip injury, and I've been able to work really, um, really uh, diligently on it and improve it. So I know not only as an athlete, it's going to help me, but also the quality of life afterwards has improved. 
I've also been doing a lot of really intentional work of learning how um, stress impacts us, you know, from a physiological standpoint, like being a personal trainer, we understand the basis or let me, re- let me step back. I am a personal trainer <laughs> and as a personal trainer, we are given basic information. We know stress is bad, but I always want to understand what is happening on a physiological level so I can help my clients more. And because my clients represent the communities I'm a part of, they're usually black or trans or queer, um, survivors of various different traumas uh, are at the front lines of activism work. So they're, they're being compounded with such high levels of stress. Um, I really wanted to make sure that I'm serving them properly. So I have spent a lot of time learning more and more uh, about just the real intricacies of how stress plays out on our bodies and the things we can do to kind of negate it as best as possible. So those were the like good things that came out of um, COVID for me personally. But, you know, it's been hard not only with COVID, but then we had the uprisings. And I, I don't know when black person, especially those of us who are descended from enslaved African people who just you know it's tiring. It hurts. I'm tired of having to fight for my existence to be not only acknowledged, but valued um, and then throw in transness on top of that of having to now deal with the community violence of like the, the transphobia and homophobia within the black community and other black folks not seeing how this is actually This is to undo white supremacy means they have to undo homophobia and transphobia because white supremacy gave birth to these things. We have always been a part of African communities. We have always been here. um, And there was a very intentional removal of us from our histories and the way they have been. We have been conditioned as a people to attack some of the people who held the sacred rights within our tribes and our people um, is very intentional. And it was a way of spiritually dismantling us and to see black people now being like, you know, you can take the LGBTQ stuff. This isn't your movement as if we aren't black. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, it's been really hard and really painful and I'm tired of having to fight my own people to be acknowledged in these moments and to have us be protected and to be brought back into circle um, within the community. So, you know, there's a lot of heartache there, but there's also been some really beautiful conversations and, you know, throughout the years, especially because I'm a part of a sport that is so predominantly black and people of color, primarily black and Latino, um, very masculine very straight, very heteronormative. I've been having these conversations for years with people who've never had access to, you know, the language or really understanding of like what it means to be homophobic and transphobic and have had them tell me they have changed as a result of knowing me. um, And they realize like trans people are real people. And this is, you know, our, our gender dysphoria isn't something that's made up. Like this is something real and, we are a part of this whole world. Um, I'm starting to still see those the, the those conversations in in the larger community. So even with all the hate that is going on, I still see there is opportunities for growth as people recognize these systems. It's not about individual prejudices; it's about systems that are holding us all down. And people are really starting to examine how the system isn't just about white or black. Like it's deeper than that. Thank you so much for that, Pat. I think it's what's always been clear and honestly beautiful about being a part of your journey is the fact that you've never separated from being like an athlete to being like a healer to being an activist. Right. And that's really what I see you as, is a parallel of all of those. Um, So folks listening to the show, they don't really know you, you know, so I appreciate you giving them those like little aspects of who you are, but I wanted to take you back just a little bit to this, journey of being an athlete like where did this start and did you always know that you wanted to do this professionally uh it's good thing when when it started I was always in a family and you know for folks who don't know me I was actually raised well I am black but I am a primarily African and Irish descent um my white family my Irish family was the ones who primarily raised me my father wasn't a big part of my life so just so that's clear my mom's family was really into sports. So my sister and I, my sister, uh, Meg Only, is uh, is also queer and amazing. I'm um, a curator out of the ICA in Philly and doing 
amazing work out there. She's one of the few uh, Black curators in these larger institutional art spaces. So, you know, I'm lucky. I also grew up with a queer sister, um, so which is like a you know, rarity, I know. So I'm And she's like my best, one of my best friends. So like we get along really well. But sports was always really important to my family. So we grew, both of us grew up playing sports, watching sports. I wasn't really into boxing until later in life, but I was always really called to fighters. Like I was a really nerdy kid. I'm still a nerdy person. I was grew up in a Japanese neighborhood. So I was watching Dragon Ball Z before it even came to the United States. And I was really into Street Fighter, and I really was like attracted to the identity of the masculinity of um, fighters. Like I love Bruce Lee and all that type of stuff. And eventually, I got into martial arts. Um, I actually got into Bruce Lee's martial art when I was like twelve or thirteen, Jeet Kune Do. Um, and I knew that I wanted to do some sort of fighting, but I never thought that I would be a professional fighter in some sort of way. Um, and it wasn't until I was about 16 or 17 that I started boxing. And in between that time, um, I really just started dissociating from myself. I felt like I was watching myself just go through the motions of life. And I know now, like in addition to other traumas I was experiencing, puberty really uh, did a number on me. And I just, I didn't know I had gender dysphoria. I just knew that I felt bad in my body and I didn't know what was wrong with me. And so, you know, the mind's an amazing thing. It will figure out how to cope with the, um, with the current reality. And it was like, okay, it's too painful to be here. Let's just check out and separate. And I knew um, that I needed to do something. Otherwise I wasn't going to make it in life. So I asked my grandma for boxing lessons for Christmas. And she took me down to, which is now closed, um, the famous LA Boxing Club outside the Olympic Auditorium. And I just instantly fell in love with the sport. And I knew it was something I wanted to do. I didn't know how far I was going to go, but I knew that, I knew then within that first day, within that first week, that boxing was going to be such an integral part of my life. That is beautiful. From street fighter to to fight in the streets itself, Pat. I didn't even know you was watching <laughs> Dragon Ball Z. I love Dragon Ball Z. When we get when we're out of this oh. shelter in place, we should have like a little marathon and watch something together. <laughs> I'm definitely down with that. We had what the way I used to watch Dragon Ball Z was there was a Japanese video store down the street from me that we would go to, and you could rent for a dollar. Um, a VHS tape of the basically recorded Dragon Ball Z episodes, no subtitles, just pure Japanese because they hadn't even brought it out to the States yet. And that's how I used to watch it. Wow, that's so cool. So you were kind of getting like a little bit of the bootleg version. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. Bootleg version. I mean, like I went to Anime Expo two through or two through 12, I think went to 10 years. So like I, 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 you know, I wonder now my family like dropped my sister and I off with like a bunch of these like grown ass adults. We were little kids and everyone looking at us like, why are these little kids here? But we were just both really into it before it really became like a big thing out in the state. That's so cool. That's so cool. So on the podcast, we talk a lot about money, mindset and motivation. And I feel like personally, I I did like karate when I was younger and I played basketball. Like sports is like so much mindset more than even like physicality. Um, If that makes sense, like I feel like the times when I've played basketball and I felt like I've been aligned is when my mind is the most aligned. So can you talk to Mm -hmm. folks like who might be listening to this, who are interested, who are boxing, who are probably just doing competitive sports? um, How do you prepare your mindset for a fight? Mm, That's a good question. Um, You know, one, I just want to make a note when we talk about sports and mind and the mindset of it, I think, you know, what I do as my work as a personal trainer is particularly helping people be present in their body. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, that's, that's what I do because that was my journey of like, Oh, trauma forced me out of my body. Uh, Trauma forces a lot of people out of their bodies. And how do we use practices to be present in ourselves? And I think there is this weird distinction and particularly within Western culture that the mind and the body are separate entities, but they're not like we are one being the mind and the body are both the one thing like it's us. Um, And spirit, if you want to throw that in is also these are all integral parts of us, but they are actually one entity. So I think sports forces us really, you have to be present if you're especially if you're going to do well and boxing more than anything, because the consequences of not being mentally present means that you could possibly be killed. Like, this is a sport, I'm not going to mince around it. Like, the goal is to hurt another person. And while 
the vast majority of boxers don't go in there to kill a fighter. It can happen. Um, so we have to always be mentally prepared and mentally sharp with it. And you can always tell when a boxer is not there. I think you can tell for every sport, but in particular any combat sports, you can really tell when one fighter is mentally on and when the other one isn't. My practices for a long time have been, um, I'm really into affirmations. Like even before my pro debut, I wrote in my journal every day, like I am victorious over and over in all caps, like, or I guess capital because I was writing with my hand, um, you know, constantly reminding myself, like I am, I've won, like I'm not going to win. I have already won when I step in there, um, constantly going through mental drills of what could happen in the fight so that, you know, neurologically speaking, I've done it all. Like even I'll rehearse bad scenarios. I'll rehearse good scenarios. I rehearse every single scenario in my mind, but every single time I go through that scenario, the end result is always the same and my hand is lifted as Victor. I'm constantly giving myself those affirmations. Even when I'm working on the bag or shadow boxing, I'm constantly visualizing myself in the fight and it's always making sure I'm winning. I'm constantly, I feel good. I feel confident. My conditioning is great. Like these constant words and instilling in myself like I'm in the best possible shape even if for some reason I know like I'm not in my best shape in my head I'm constantly telling myself you're ready you've done this before you're you're you are a winner like you're going to continue to win so that's been my usual um my usual practice mentally around it is just constantly going through the drills constantly visualizing my victory and going through every single scenario and then writing out those affirmations every single day that, you know, I'm, I am winning this fight. I have won this fight. That's beautiful. And you did win that fight, by the way, <laughs> which was so yes, cool. I did. <laughs> Ooh, it was so cool to see. I mean, I, I, I grew up watching, you know, boxing with my family, but to be able to like be in the house, we had made some wings. I mean, Pat, we got it ready for you. You know, we had our drinks ready <laughs> and to see somebody I knew on the TV, um, about to make it happen. It was just like so cool, but I was nervous. I have to admit, like I was scared for you. Um, not just because like, you were fighting, but because of like all the pressure of you being like the first, right. Um, of the mixed messages around, like, is this acceptable? Is this not from people who just don't understand our community? So can you talk to folks a little bit about like how you spiritually prepare for that? Not just the fight, but the impact of being the first and making history. I thought a lot about what that, um, what that fight really happened. I think I was so much in shock and in the moment of it, I kept saying like, Oh, it's just a fight. It's just, everything's the same. Uh, but it wasn't, you know, that would, that would not be the truth. It definitely wasn't, you know, my team, I'm very, very um, fortunate to have an amazing team behind me. Um, and they also, they knew the stakes, um, even though their constant language to the public was, he's just another man. He's just another boxer. This is just another fight. But they, you know, afterwards would tell me like, I know this isn't the same. Like, I know what this means. And, you know, for them, it was a huge victory, too, and kind of a big fuck you to the people. I'm sure they had a lot of people questioning why they were um, putting me out there, right? Because there were so many people who thought, like, I was going to get hurt or destroyed and, you know, that I didn't deserve to be there. And I also point out, like, a lot of those people were not people in boxing. Um, I've earned a lot of respect in this sport. I had a lot of love and a lot of um, a lot of boxers who – and boxers, referees, coaches, um, people I didn't even know came up to me during my pro debut to say like, just so you know, we've been following your story and we respect you and we want to see you do what you want to do. You know, I had so much love and I think that also helped is that I've earned a lot of respect over the years um, from this community. But, you know, it was a lot and I really just tried to block it out. I remember distinctly um, when they were bringing me out for my fight and, you know, I've, I've had over 70 matches at this point, like getting into the ring is not something new. I've had pretty high stakes fights um, on Team USA, international competition, the Olympic trials back in 2012, like pressure is not something new to me. Um, but as I walked out and they were having me wait and the smog machine or the fog machine started and there was like a brief second as I was staring at the, um, the ring with a light and I was like, oh shit. Like it hit me like everything you have fought for, for six years to get to this point, it's on right now. And 
you never know what's going to happen with boxing. Like when my, my people are fighting, I'm nervous as hell. It is very nerve wracking with someone you care about because this isn't, this isn't just an athlete, which we should always care about an athlete. But when you have a personal connection to someone, this is a dangerous sport. Like this is the hurt business. Um, a lot of things can happen. And, you know, in that moment, that split second, I had everything hit me, like everything hit me in that moment. And then I remind myself, you've done this before. You've been here. This is just a fight. And then my music started and I walked out and I was in the zone. And, you know, I also, as much as I got in the zone, even during my fight, the pressures of it, I wanted to, to, to knock that guy out. Like I wanted to prove it to everyone. And there was a consequence to me not being mentally focused, thinking about mindset and being mentally there. I wasn't focused and he cracked me. And those small gloves, um, a lot of my friends who are pros kept telling me, they're like, yo, wait till you get hit with those eight ounce gloves. It's a whole different ball game. I got hit with those eight ounce gloves and I got rocked. And I came back to my corner and I sat down and my coach was like, you can easily win this fight. Let me give you instructions. And I was like, okay, I got to let go of everything that I was holding. Even the outcome of this event, I need to let go of. I can't, I'm like, I've done everything I needed to to get to this point. I need to just be present. I need to execute. And I let everything go, came out the third round and completely outboxed him and won the fight. Um, so even, even with my mental preparation, even having everything down, it still came out. Like it's still all that pressure came out. And I almost, I almost lost because of that. And I, I can't even imagine what, what would have been the result, not only for myself, but my community. Um, if I had been knocked out in that fight, like they would have been like, Oh, clearly trans men can't compete against men. Um, so I'm glad I was able to pull it together. I'm glad that I have such a great relationship with my coach, Victor Valenzuela, that I knew what he was telling me was exactly what I needed to do. He made sure to calm me down. My whole corner made sure to calm me down and said, you can do this. And I trust and I believe in them and I love them so much that I knew they were telling me the truth. And all I had to do was execute. You did that, Pat. You executed. You killed the game. I'm I'm so thankful that you that you won. But it's it's really I think these are some keys right here, and I hope folks are really listening about like how your mindset around being present even was able to give you the gifts in that moment to win that fight, right? Because you were able to like get in that corner and actually calm down and get into your present moment, right? Which a lot of people without that practice, without that affirmation. I'm also always talk about it's like daily practice when it comes to healing ourselves and it's never over, right? Like we're constantly doing mm -hmm. it. So thank you so much for sharing and just for like letting us see that introspection. So the other thing that I'm always like proud of with you and just so many of, of, of my boys is the entrepreneurship, the willingness to go out and not just rely on, you know, corporate money, but to really like figure out like how can we not just build money but resources for our community so can you tell us a little bit about just you know your personal training um i know that you were doing some work with like was it like social media marketing at one point um where are you in your journey as an entrepreneur yeah well, i've had so many jobs <laughs> i've had so many jobs i think you always um, you have like you know, five or six jobs usually at one time <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, man, I that's always a joke. My like people are like, you've had you live so many different places and you've had so many different jobs. I would be like, I would get one job and then be like, nah, it doesn't work out, let me quit. Um, because I'm not good at working for people. Like I know that about myself. Like I I just I I'm actually a really good team player, but I have to really respect the mission to be involved in it. And I'm for the most part, corporations, businesses, they don't work well for me. I've also spent you know, my entire life, like at least teenage life into adulthood, boxing being my priority. And, you know, I was on Team USA. I traveled. There was no way I could hold a nine to five job and be able to have the training schedule that I had, the competition schedule, the travel schedule, everything like that. So, you know, for me, I didn't go to college. Like I don't have anything to fall back on. Like I, I'm, I'm really one of those all in people. I went all in. I was like, this is something I love. This is something I want to do. Um, I was going to go up to Canada, go to college. And I was like, nah, I want to stay in box. So I made these choices. And, and as a result of that, there have been consequences. I don't have financial stability. Um, you know, I'm a black trans man without, with a very spotty employment history and no degree to fall back on. So the only opportunity for me is entrepreneurship. So I've been doing various like hustles, side hustles, like whatever I need to get money to raise, um, for my training at at the time, especially when I was amateur, 
Uh, I had to raise a bunch of money and hustle that out during the Olympic trials because I had a shoulder injury and my physical therapy bills were so expensive, but I knew I had to do it in order to be able to make it to the Olympic trials. There was one point where I was working three different jobs, I was working as a balancer, I was working at this gym, I was doing personal training. Then on the weekends when I'd be doing a uh, ballet at the, the club that I worked at, I'd be selling like my mom's blondies and soda outside. Like I'm always got something going on. You know, I want to now, I've been much more formalizing what I want to do as work. Um, I did go into digital marketing for a bit. Mainly, I started there in order to market my own services. And then I was like, oh, I can do this for other people. It doesn't particularly bring me joy. Um, and I really, you know, time is precious. Life is precious. I, you know, I'm greedy in that I don't want to have to compromise that much about the things I love. So I didn't want to do that work anymore, even if it made money. So I've gone back into my roots and what I've been known for for a long time. And I realized is the thing I can offer people is my personal training and my particular kind of personal training, which, you know, there's a lot of great personal trainers out there. I'm very poised to be um, the more like, I'm going to give you a scientific understanding of the physiology of trauma. Like that's who I am. I'm not, I'm not a very spiritual teacher there are people who do somatic work i don't i come from a sports performance background um that's who i am and you know it's given me not only an opportunity to make money but also to like positively support a lot of leaders and um i'm really grateful for to that i've made a lot of great connections with people i have a lot of great clients who are doing amazing work in this world and just to be able to be there to support them uh, you know, I can, I don't always consider, I don't consider myself an activist. You know, people will give me that label. I don't personally consider myself that. I feel like I support activists to be able to do their work, just like my strength conditioning coaches support me in being able to do my work as a boxer. Um, that's how I feel my game is. So that's where I primarily make my money. I also do speaking engagements. I really enjoy um, being able to tell my truth. Uh, that has also made me a little, uh, well, I, that may change now because now people are suddenly like willing to listen to the hard truths. But before I was a little too radical. And I think people are always surprised because they always just labeled me, oh, this boxer. Like, like I couldn't have a critical understanding of systemic oppression, especially at their my real lived experiences. So I've also been privileged to be able to speak at the National um, Center for Civil and Human Rights. I was able to go to... Um, San Francisco 49ers stadium and speak um, at their very first pride event. Um, I've actually been able to go back to the Olympic training center that I trained at um, as an, uh, you know, an athlete as in the amateurs and been able to be on panels and, you know, tell them about themselves in terms of like the intersection of racism and transphobia and homophobia and misogyny that we see in sports so often. So that's also something that I really love to do. Um, and I don't, I guess it is like another hustle, but like, you know, we're in a place where people are finally understanding that the knowledge that I have isn't theoretical. Like this is lived experiences and people are finally putting, you know, money behind it. Be like, we should be listening and valuing your experiences. Cause there's, I mean, I don't know a lot of people in this world that have my experiences like out there and they're valuable and they're going to be shaping cause they're going to be more, there are more trans athletes. There are more black trans athletes. Um, there are more black trans masculine athletes coming out. Like I know them, they talk to me. Um, there needs to be made space for them. So I really enjoy being able to talk and use my experience, not only for also the inclusion of trans people, but understanding like this is universal, being yourself, being true to yourself and dealing with the consequences and knowing there will be consequence for it is universal. Um, I think my story can help people in trying to figure out what, what lines are they willing to draw for themselves and what are they willing to do in order to be their full self? That's real. That's real. Cause I mean, it, it is a choice when you think about it, about being out and being more stealth about who you are. Um, and I've always thought about that when it comes to you, Pat, like I, I, I really appreciate you saying like, you don't like to be called an activist because I would call you an activist, but I'm not going to put that <laughs> label on you if you don't want it. Um, but I think what, what drew me to that conclusion was the aspect that you still very much speak about, you know, who you are and your journey um, and are willing to be vulnerable 
but also are willing to go in and kick someone's ass. Um, so, you know, like, <laughs> like that's like a, a parallel that we don't see. And I, and I think that people not only need to value your story, but they need to realize that they need to run you your check for it too. Right. So I'm so happy that you're mm-hmm. able to like get these speaking engagements and that these, these organizations who often take our stories and erase them or choose to do what they want are paying you because they need to be doing that. Um, so I have one more question and then we're going to jump into our final section, which is like boy talk and hop. It's like a fill in the blank to see where your mind is. Um, my yeah. final question for you is like, what tips, could you mention this a little bit, but what tips would you give a, a masculine center person who wants to step into the realm of being like a professional athlete? Like, is there, Are there any things that you would let them know about that they should be thinking about? I talked to so many different folks like in my journey, especially doing the podcast who are interested, but afraid often of like what that really means, especially folks who are like in high school, right? Like still trying to figure out like, where they can take their journey. Yeah, you know, th- my usual advice to people, and it, it, you know, may or may not be helpful, but I, th- I think it's honest. And, you know, I'm someone who very, very much prefers to be honest and blunt. Um, you know, with this type of journey, especially when you're trans, or you're not conforming, doing anything that is pushing back against the norm, um, you have to really assess how bad you want it because it's going to be rough. Like, that's, there's no way to, like, fluff it I don't want people to go in there thinking it's going to be easy because it's not. But if it's something that you're willing to do, be willing to pay the price for it. And, it, you know, at the at the very least, you can always look back and say, I did it. Like, I didn't compromise myself for it. Like, I did it. I put myself out there. And regardless of where that takes you in the journey, that will take you far in life in general. Just that willingness to risk it all. And I think that's why so many people are attracted to athletes. Um I think that athletes, they are our modern day warriors. Like if we think about like, yes, yeah, soldiers in the military, but the, the military is there for the state's interest. It's not there for the individual's interest. It's not there for the community's interest. It's for the state. But athletes, they represent their communities. They are a part of their communities, especially for marginalized identities, especially for black folks. I mean, the connection between athleticism and sport and black people in America is so so tightly wound together that, you know, for folks that are of those marginalized identities to stand out there and be like, I'm putting a stake in the ground and I'm saying proudly, I'm going to do this sport. I'm going to do it as myself. Like that is us returning to our roots. That is returning to us being in these communities where we held places of honor and we were respected and we were seen as people who staggered the line of, of the spirit world and the physical world. I, I personally feel like this proclamation is actually acknowledgement of our ancestors who came before our ancestors who were, you know, gender nonconforming and queer and trans and have been erased. Like this is the way we're living their embodiment in these current times. And I'm biased because I'm an athlete. I think it should be in every aspect of our life, but I do think there is something very particular in sport around this issue. And we're seeing that we're seeing the state coming after trans bodies, trans kids bodies in a way um, and using sport as an excuse to be trans misogynistic. And I think, you know, this is going to be our next fight and our next turning point in acknowledging like sport is a human right. And sport is something that is a part of every human culture out there. And to make sure that we are taking up space as our true selves is a way of us having, um, having not only a, an impact on the culture, but also I think on a spiritual aspect. Ashe, bringing in the ancestors, Pat. You better tell folks. You better tell. We've been here. We've been here. We've been powerful. We've been divine. Thank you for showing up for the show and getting to it. Right, like we've been here. Thank you, yeah. Pat. That just warmed me up so good. Like, oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so, um, what projects are you working on, and how can folks get involved? How can folks follow you? And let's just do a little bit of manifesting. I know, I know I said that was my last question, but you got me feeling so good. Where do we see Pat in five years from now? Ooh, good question. So the first one was, what am I doing now? Then where can they follow me? And then the last one is, where, where's Pat going to be in five years, right? Yep. Okay, I want to make sure I got that right. What's going on right now is I'm hoping to get back into uh, full training. Um, excuse me, within a couple of weeks. Uh, my partner just had surgery. Um, they're okay. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm making sure to be super uh, cautious around exposure. Um, I've already talked to my team and my coach and the gyms have kind of 
the local gyms have opened up here. So we're going to try to go back into training. I'm going to just try to get, you know, a few more fights in, hoping to get a fight in this year. You know, it's been really disappointing to not be able to be out there doing what I love, but I understand these are difficult circumstances, but you know, we're going to, we're going to try to get back out there. In the meantime, I'm going to be out on the, uh, I guess, Zoom circuit <laughs> and, and through on um, social media, through interviews I've had just, and really connecting with various people with athletes um, in particular around the need to be inclusive of trans people and trans athletes and really making sure not to forget us. And just, yeah, I think that's primarily, I'm trying to think, I'm like, who knows what's going to happen this year? I mean, I, it's, it's hard to even see a month farther where California may be closing up again. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but those are, those are the things that I can control is just working out, continuing to further develop, um, my knowledge of training in terms of a stress response, especially in these times of really high stress, um, going to be doing a couple of things. We'll be dropping around August uh, that I'm going to be doing of like group training with folks with some new protocols, helping with stress management and using food and movement to really um, help support them. So uh, you can go to my Instagram is probably the best place uh, team underscore Patricio underscore manual. Um, so I'll be letting more information out about that. I'm kind of letting the summer settle, um, let everyone enjoy the summer, everyone settle here and then start rolling that stuff out as fall creeps around. And five years from now, um, I really, I've been talking a lot to, um, my loved ones and we really, really want, and I think this has been, this has been something we've had conversations about for a while. And the, the, this has been the goal, regardless of what's going on now. But I've been seeing a lot more public conversations about this of like, we need land. You know, I want to have land. I want to be self sufficient on the land. I want to heal my connection to the land, especially as someone who comes from people who were connected to it, like not only on my father's side, um, you know, as enslaved African people who, you know, work the land where, where they came from in Africa and then were forced to work the land here, but also on my mom's side, you know, they were Irish farmers um, who were killed and res- as a result of the resistance to the British simply for the fact that they wanted their farmlands. Um, people aren't familiar often with the history over there and the colonization, but the British grabbed a lot of the farming land to feed their soldiers um, and the Irish starved as a result of it. So that was what my family did is they were resisting and being like, this is our land. Like this is the land we have tilled we're willing to die for it. And unfortunately they did die for it. So I think there, there's something calling in my spirit to really ground and get back in the rhythm of this earth and really ground and go back into hard work, but hard work for the land and to feed my people and to um, create a space for my people rather than working, um, you know, for other people or even in this, you know, capitalistic structure. So five years from now, I'm hoping that we have some sort of land and it, with, Sorry, my dog is walking all in front of me and hitting the phone. Um, so we have some land so that we can also run some retreats and just be a, a, a place that people can reset their whole nervous system. So I'm calling it into existence five years from now. I'm going to be in some more rural area um, learning how to work the land, learning how to um, you know, tend to, to livestock and being able to create this space for others. Beautiful, Pat. I'm going to be out there with you. We've been um, working on our patio <laughs> part, patio garden and getting our like brown to green thumb going. And I keep telling folks, I want to just be somewhere where you got to find me on coordinates. I don't even have an address. I got to send you some coordinates to find me. It's just off the grid. So. Yep, I'm right there with you. <laughs> yep. So I could definitely see see us in our in our older, older age out there doing that together. So let's manifest <laughs> that. So let's head into Boy Talk and Hop. So this is like a fill in the blank type of vibe. It's only a few questions. Um, so I'm going to give you a statement and you'll fill in the blank. So for example, I would say like love is, and then you would fill in the blank with whatever your expression for love is. Sound good? Okay. Sounds good. All right. So the first question is, my favorite book is. Ooh, God, you just start off with a hard one. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Pat. <laughs> damn. I'm like, there's so there's so many. Um, I'm going to say the autobiography of Malcolm X, because that was one of the first books I read when I was 18 that really gave me language to understand the rage of being black in this country. I shaded that. My favorite food is. Mm, that's also another hard one. I love food. Um, my favorite food is probably pork belly. Oh, 
me too. Especially some ramen. Oh, it's making me hungry. <laughs> money is. Mm. You're going to give me easy ones. Money is complicated. If you could spend a day with anyone dead or alive, what would you do and who would it be? I would, I would spend the day with Archie Moore. That has always, he has always been my boxing icon um, and the person I look up to the most. Uh, a lot of people don't know who Archie Moore is. He, uh, he holds the world record uh, for the most knockouts. But the thing about Archie Moore is he was called the old mongoose because he was such a clever boxer. Um, he was also the oldest champion um, in the light heavyweight division. He was because of racism, anti-black racism, he wasn't given the opportunity to challenge for the title until he was 38 years old. So I would love to be able to hear his stories. Like he traveled the world. Um, he always had these like amazing stories he would talk about um, when he fought over in Australia and supposedly was with the Aboriginal people. Um, you know, I want to know his stories around that. I want to know his boxing. I just really want to bask in his wisdom and his wit and just, you know, be able to witness someone who boxers old school boxers know a lot of people don't know know him as much nowadays um but to me i think he was actually someone that that planted a seed of persistence and i really want to thank him for that oh that would be beautiful my favorite song is Mm -hmm. my favorite song there's so many i like i think uh i'm trying to go out i'm blanking on (laughs) I'm <laughs> blanking on the name of my song. Oh my god! Um, it's from. Uh, you know what? No, I'm gonna go with a hype song that actually isn't even like a, a deep song. There are plenty of deep songs I like. I'm gonna say Kryptonite by Purple Ribbon All Star because I listened to that fight before every single fight I've had since 2006 for my first national tournament, and that song will always get me hyped. So I'm gonna put that as like my my favorite joyous song. That song's going to have hella streams after this interview, right? <laughs> <laughs> love is. Mm. Love is unending, I think. I think once you've loved someone, like truly loved someone, I don't think, even when that relationship container transition, I don't think that love ever really leaves, right? And I think that's, that's how we're all immortal in this world because who knows where we go when we transition, but I think our love impacts people even in ways we have no idea and continues to reverberate throughout the, uh, the time. So yeah, love is unending. Wellness is. Wellness is balance. Um, a lot of the work I've been doing is really understanding that this world throws us so far out of balance. It puts us out of, out of touch with our natural rhythms and everything's in a cycle. So I think wellness is when we've figured out how to have that balance. And last but never least, Pat is. Uh, Pat is unbreakable. You sure are my friend. Thank you so much for this interview, (laughs) for holding space with me, for getting me pumped up on this Saturday. You're just so motivational, Pat. I really appreciate you. No, thank you so much for having me. Are you going to be bumping uh, Kryptonite now? I go back am. I'm actually. I think I am going to go back because I, I'm going on like a little nature walk. I'm going to take myself on a nature walk today to get outside. And that actually might be a cut that I listen to probably more than one time. So thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I'm like, people are like, oh, shit, I forgot about that song. <laughs> exactly. I hadn't thought about it in so long. That's why I like asking the question, though, because, you know, especially in this shelter in place, it's good to have some good music. Thank you so much for listening to Boy Meets Wellness. You can listen to more episodes and become even more incredible by heading over to boymeetswellness.com and checking out some of our resources. We really appreciate you. Have an incredible day. I'm Patricio Pat Manuel, and I'm born obviously incredible. Thanks for listening to Boy Meets Wellness. Stay connected on and off the show by following us online at Boy Meets Wellness. That's boy with an I. Until next time, go be incredible. Be incredible.